All right. Hello, everybody. It looks like we are live. As always, I am just going to take a second to make sure that is actually the case and I can hear myself before I actually do anything else. Because for those of you that have seen me do this before, uh, there was at least one time when I started and I couldn't hear, nobody could hear anything, but we're good. So welcome everybody. I am thrilled to be here today. My guest, as you can see, is Dr. Ken Miller, who is a professor of biology at Brown University. He has also written a number of books. Uh, Finding Darwin's God is probably the one you are familiar with, if you are familiar with any of them. Uh, also, Only a Theory, Evolution in the Battle for America's Soul, and The Human Instinct, How We Evolved to Have Reason, Consciousness, and Free Will. And also, there is a decent chance you used one of Dr. Miller's textbooks in your high school biology class. Uh, the different versions kind of go by the, if I recall, they go by the, the animal on the cover. And I think, I forget if I had the elephant or the dragonfly, but that was, I was one, one of those was the one that I had in high school. So um, today we are here and we are going to talk about, um, rather than anything specific uh, about evolution and creationism and creation science, like what we normally do here for people that don't know, is we, we examine specific claims of creation science. But today we're going to talk a little more 30,000 foot about kind of that whole conversation. What's the approach? What's the role? What's the function of having, as biologists, having the conversation with creationists and about creationism? So um, without further ado, um, Dr. Miller, uh, would you just want to take a couple minutes to introduce yourself further if you want, or we could jump right in. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts on kind of just, we could start with just big picture. Why should biologists care about creationism and talking about creationism? Well, I, I, I you know, I'll, uh, uh, you did a good job introducing me. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, but let me, I, I think the best way to get into this is to sort of uh, explain my own personal history just a, a tiny bit. Um, I, uh, uh, I grew up in New Jersey um, and uh, uh, did my graduate work in cellular biology at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, that department at Boulder is a very well-known cell and molecular biology department. Uh, I was uh, pretty lucky with my thesis work and I jumped right to being an assistant professor at Harvard. And I was there for about six years. And then my undergraduate alma mater, Brown, made me a very nice offer. Um, the, um, I jumped at the chance to come back and I've been at Brown ever since. And just to sort of uh, make things fit even better, I met my wife when we were both undergrads and she was at the Rhode Island School of Design. She's an artist. So she knew the Providence area as well. So that's the reason we came back. So one of the things besides my own field, cell biology, I've always enjoyed teaching, and not every bio professor would tell you this, I've always enjoyed teaching freshman introductory biology, believe it or not. And one of the reasons for that is first of all, um, I enjoy generalizing. In other words, talking and researching things that are really outside of my immediate field, which is sort of structural biology. Um, and then the second thing is I always saw teaching a broad spectrum intro course like that as an opportunity to evangelize for biology. And what I mean by that is to try to convince college students at the beginning of their career of the importance of science itself and the life sciences in particular. So my very first semester at Brown, which was the fall of 1980, I did exactly that. I had a big class. I enjoyed teaching at that level, as I mentioned. And then in the spring semester, I had no teaching to do, which was good because I was setting up my laboratory. So I'm getting my research equipment together and getting a research program growing. And a group of students came to me and uh, they complimented my teaching, which was always a nice thing to hear. Um, they asked me how I became so at home with public speaking. And I told them, well, you know, I was the kind of kid in high school who ran for things and was elected this and that. And then I mentioned foolishly that I also did debate. And they said, oh, you did debate. Cool. We're from Campus Crusade for Christ. And we've invited 
the country's foremost scientific creationist to come and lecture. And he has challenged any member of the faculty at Brown to debate him on the theory of evolution. Then they said, you've done debate before. Why don't you debate him? And my answer was, I'm a cell biologist. I don't do evolution. Go away. And they kind of, were kind of pushy. And uh, they said, well, is there any chance he's right? And I said, of course he's not right. If evolution was had a great fundamental flaw, people in the field itself would be tearing it apart because that's how you build a reputation in science. It's not by confirming things. It's by, it's by upsetting the apple cart. Well, they were persistent. Finally, I said, yeah, cool, I'll do this. And this took place in April 1981. And it was particularly timely because at that moment, two states, Arkansas and Louisiana, had both passed laws requiring the teaching of so-called creation science. And neither law had been tested in the court yet. So, you know, maybe this is going to be the big new thing. Well, I spent easily five weeks um, in preparation for this, and I read uh, books on scientific creationism. I listened to audio debates, and the more I listened, the more irritated I became. And I became irritated for two reasons. One is the, 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 the enormous number of distortions of scientific fact that were used to argue against evolution and argue in favor of a young earth, a recent creation of the universe, uh, you know, all this other sort of stuff. And what really irritated me was the argument that anyone who was a professing Christian had to reject evolution. Well, you know, I don't make any special claim of religiosity, but I have been my entire life uh, practicing Roman Catholic, practicing to the best of my ability. And I knew very, very well that there are many religious traditions, including my own, that accept evolution. And I thought this notion that if you accept evolution, it makes you um, some sort of an atheist uh, was just not true. So that really bugged me a lot. So I prepared and prepared and I prepared for this debate. And to my astonishment, the student group sold so many tickets to this debate that we had to move it to the largest room on our campus, which if you know what a New England university is like, that turned out to be the ice hockey rink. <laughs> and nearly 3,000 people, I'm not kidding, 3,000 people came to that debate. Yeah, so no pressure or anything. Yeah, well, you know, I, and, and again, I'm an unknown young assistant professor, okay? They weren't there to hear me. They were here to hear this thing. And, and it, 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 you know, I could have won the Nobel Prize and I could not have drawn 3,000 people to a lecture. <laughs> and it impressed upon me how passionately people felt about this subject, how much it meant to them, and also how profoundly misled they had been by the so-called scientific creationist movement. And the, the debate went on for more than three hours. Um, I'm a microscopist by training, and therefore I'm a very visual person. And I literally had two old fashioned carousels of 35 millimeter slides mm -hmm. ready to deal with every single little argument that my opponent put forth. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, I pretty much won the day. And the reason I, I say that um, is because the person I was debating, Henry Morris, who was the founder of the Institute for Creation Research in his own in-house newsletter, complimented me by saying I was the most effective evolutionist debater he had met up to that point and mentioned the fact that the crowd actually laughed at some of his arguments and this sort of stuff. And I thought, boy, this really matters to people. And even though evolution was not really my field, I allowed myself to be drawn into several other debates with Henry Morris and also with his associate, a guy named Dwayne Gish, Mm -hmm. who was probably their foremost debater at the time. Now, when I approached this, there was something important here. And I realized, among other things, that a very, very large proportion of the lay audience that was going to hear these debates 
And later on, when I just went to college campuses and other places to just speak about evolution, an awful lot of them had the stereotype, had, had, the, had the, the inclination that evolution was sort of cooked up in the 19th century precisely to challenge the biblical account of creation and precisely to deprive people of their faith. And the point that I tried to emphasize really right at the beginning is that those of us who are involved in science do not go into science with any necessary predisposition either for or against religious faith. We go into science because we want to understand the world. We want to understand how life works. It's curiosity that unites us. And if you look across the demographics of the scientific community, you will indeed find many practicing scientists who are atheists and some who are agnostics, but you'll also find Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Catholics and Southern Baptists, and they are all united, not in their religious beliefs, but they are all united in this common language of inquiry into nature. So what I try to emphasize when I speak to uh, an avowedly Christian audience is the following. We call the message of Jesus, we call Christianity the truth. In fact, the great truth with a capital T. Therefore, as a Christian, your first question about evolution ought not to be, does it contradict your reading of the book of Genesis? Is it contradicted by what Jesus said about Adam or by the letters of Paul? No, 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 no. Your first question about evolution is simple. Is it true? And the way I've tried to approach it in various audiences is simply to sort of lift the veil on the scientific method, to explain why we know that the earth is old, to explain why, how we know that life has not always been the same, that life has changed over time, and also what we understand about that process of change, which is the process of evolution. And in so doing, what I try very hard to do when I speak to a lay audience is to say, look, here's how science actually works, not with a preconceived idea, but with a whole lot of curiosity and a willingness to consider all sorts of alternative explanations. And once you come up with what you think is an appropriate explanation, do you know who your toughest critics are? Your toughest critics are your fellow scientists. And therefore, the scientific enterprise itself doesn't always get things right. That's a fact. But it's also a fact that within the scientific enterprise, there is a built-in mechanism that catches air, that corrects it, that moves us closer and closer to an understanding of what the world is like and an understanding of how life works. And I find that in terms of trying to bring people into the scientific process in a way that doesn't involve religious preconceptions. I find that very, uh, very compelling for a lot of people. So that's the approach I generally take. Thank you. That actually was, I hope, very enlightening for everybody, especially the, the history part. I was going to ask you specifically about that first debate with, uh, with Henry Morris. So thank you. Um, also, fun note. Uh, so what I do right now is that I am a full-time teaching faculty now at Rutgers, and the thing that I do full-time fall and spring is the big intro bio course. Mm. And what I've tried to do over the last five years or so is reframe that course. It used to be, we used to call it, um, when I was actually a TA in the course in grad school, it was sometimes called a museum course because it was like, here's this worm and here's this thing and here. And, and since I've become involved, you know, in the, the design and the actual instruction, I've been able to, along with my colleagues, reframe it around an evolutionary framework to, to link together all those units where I don't know if you organize your freshman bio the same way, but you, you start with the, with the biochem and then go up to the, the, you know, the genetics and do Mendel and, and Morgan and everything, and then evolution and ecology, and then go from there. And framing it that way is, is I find very useful because now we have a unifying idea that takes all these different scales and all these different themes. And it also, uh, accomplishes or allows me to try to accomplish something that you mentioned, which is try to like evangelize for biology. Like this is great. I want everybody in this room 
by the end of the semester to have found something where there's maybe it's just like a 30 minute piece of one class, but I want you to be able to go that thing. That's what I want to do more of. And having some kind of uniting underlying idea allows you to pluck from different places and synthesize whatever that, whatever that big thing is that can really get people engaged and on board. Yeah, so, I, I was going to say the uh, it, it, next week I will meet uh, with my teaching assistants for this intro course. We start a semester on January 20th. And one of the things that I will tell them, and for those of you people in your audience, I, I want you to really understand what I mean by evangelize, which is um, basically what I tell my teaching assistants is, look, I know we're all at a university where other disciplines are taught. There's economics, there's physics, uh, there's computer sciences, there's foreign languages, there's American history and all these other wonderful things. But for the life of me, I don't understand why any young person in the year 2021 <laughs> would want to go into any field other than biology. And I am determined to try to convince every single student in our class of exactly that fact. And um, so in other words, the joke that I would give, and I, I, I beg the indulgence of my colleagues in other fields for this, the joke I would make is I'm trying to save their souls from the humanities and the social sciences and then bring them into the fold of natural science. And, and you know, as I say, I, I beg the indulgence of my colleagues in other fields because I think they should teach their disciplines in exactly the same way. Um, and I think ideally that's, that, that's how all of us as educators um, should act. And I tell my graduate students, if they really are passionate about learning how to teach, I always tell them, don't try to sound scientific, try to sound human. There is a reason why you decided to pursue a master's or a PhD in biology or biochemistry and let that passion for the field come out in your teaching and students will understand it and they'll be able to put things in connection. The other thing is, you know, you mentioned that some people have called it the museum course where you, you know, bring this fact forward and that fact forward and so forth and so on. The great Harvard biologist Ernst Mayer once said that without evolution, biology is merely stamp collecting. <laughs> and what yep. he meant by that is that biology seems to be a bunch of isolated facts. Here's the structure of the small intestine. Here's how a nerve impulse works. Here is the shape of a bird's beak and these sorts of things. What evolution does is to tie everything together into a single explanatory framework. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And that certainly is a large part of my teaching and actually a large part of my writing as well. Uh, and I think once students see that, they realize the role that evolution plays in all fields of biology um, and the way and, and its central importance in biology education as well. So I want to, I want to, I could talk about education and evolution in that context literally all day long. It's basically what I think about most of my waking time when my children are not immediately in my vicinity. But I do want to bring this back specifically to scientific creationism because related to this idea of, okay, we have a big audience of students and we're going to, we're going to introduce this idea of evolution as a big uniting idea. Now, changing gears a little bit to that, we talked a little bit about a, a lay audience. What about a scientific creationist audience? So actual qualified scientists now. One of the big ongoing questions, and something I'm sure you've grappled with for a long time, is how should mainstream biology and mainstream biologists engage with, uh, you know, for example, at CMI, you have like PhD biologists on staff. You've got at AIG, you have PhD biologists on staff. Um, they're, 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 they're not engaging with the scientific process in the way that the field normally does. You know, they have their own kind of in-house, they call them research journals, but they're not really peer reviewed, right? But they kind of go through the motions of like this, you know, doing science. And there's kind of a, a, a push and pull of like, do we say, okay, look, you're welcome to submit your papers to whatever journal you want. You're welcome to make your pre submit to, you know, give talks to wherever you want. You're not going to do these things. You're not engaging. So, okay, I'm going to go back over here and keep doing my work and keep, you know, publishing my research. Or do we have an obligation 
to acknowledge like they're out there, they're publicizing their work, whether it's good, bad, shoddy, not shoddy, published in a journal or not, it's being made public, it's being disseminated. So should biologists pay attention to that and engage with it through non-scientific channels? And this is something, obviously I've come down on one side of this issue, but it's something that I grapple with kind of what's the value added here versus just letting it compete in science and lose. Yeah, there, there was, uh, when I got drawn into this, which is the early 1980s, um, I felt that the public square had been pretty much abandoned by the scientific community and the scientific creationists so-called were populating it. And I thought it was very important to step into that public square. And that's why I talk about addressing lay audiences and say, no, 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 here's, here's how we understand evolution. Here's the evidence behind it. Here's why, no, we do not think that the enormous plethora of fossils in the fossil record was laid down in a single 40-day flood. Um, uh, there's very good reason uh, to reject that hypothesis and all these other sorts of things. And I can make those reasons understandable to you, and then you'll see what's there. Now, the interesting thing about that, and this is very important, is when I have the opportunity to speak or debate, one of the things I do not do is to say, hey, I got a PhD. Hey, I've taught at some prestigious, that's, that's irrelevant. And I try to let people see that what makes for truth is not the string of degrees behind somebody's name, or even if they have no degrees at all. Um, what you should be able to do is to make the science understandable to an interested person so that they themselves can see the logic behind the conclusions that the scientific community has made and has come to consensus over. So I think that's very important. Now, with respect to engagement, um, th there came a time, and it was not too long after the Kitz Miller versus Dover trial, which we can talk about if you like, there came a time when I thought, you know what? These questions have been answered. A number of books have been written to address uh, scientific creationism, so-called intelligent design. These ideas have been tried even in the courts. Um, and at this point, um, I said, no, I, I'm not going to debate uh, scientific creationists anymore in a public stage because the very act of stepping up alongside someone on a stage tends to lend equivalence to the new ideas. So just, just to give you an example, I think it was in 2014 or 2015, Ken Ham, uh, the Australian preacher who came to this country in search of a larger and you know wealthier population of followers, uh, who started the Creation Museum in Northern Kentucky and more recently the, the Noah's Ark Park, the Ark Park, yeah, managed to get Bill Nye the science guy to agree to debate him in a highly publicized debate. Now, I happen to think that Mr. Nye, although he's an engineer by training and not a scientist, uh, I happen to think Mr. Nye did pretty well. Um, he had a couple of failings. He clearly did not understand radiometric dating, and he could not answer some of Ken Han's objections. But otherwise, I think he did really, really well. However... Ken Ham won that debate as soon as he stepped on the stage next to Bill Nye because it enabled people to say, well, you can believe this or you can believe that. And of course, if you're a Bible believer, so-called, you're going to lean towards Ken Ham. And Ken Ham gets, uh, understands very well that being mentioned in the company of scientists lends credibility to his ideas where the ideas themselves um, uh, uh, cannot earn cannot earn these things on themselves. Now, with respect, to, as you said, to the PhD level scientists who might be at the Discovery Institute or answer yeah. Genesis, you know, once again, you know, you have to keep in mind that having a PhD after your name, I don't want to say it's no big deal, because uh, those of us who have earned doctorates worked really hard for them. The doctorate is an open ended degree. It's not something you finish in a set number of ideas, in a set number of years. It's something for which you have to make an original piece of scholarship, a contribution to the scientific community. So I don't mean to make light of it, but it does not automatically lend authority 
to every single thing you say or do. And the fact of the matter is the work of these uh, people with scientific credentials associated with these organizations stands or falls on the basis of the work themse- work itself and also of their reception by the rest of the scientific community. Now, the interesting thing, and you know, in, in the days when I debated, I would run across people like Jonathan Wells um, and Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute who would write books and make scientific arguments. And I would say, you know, this is very interesting. Uh, I'd like to see you at the Cell Biology Society meetings. I'd like to see you at the Molecular Biology Society meetings. And I'd like you to present those ideas in front of a crowd of people who are actually in the field and see what happens. Because I know very well what would happen, which is they would fall apart under scientific scrutiny. But the attention and the activities of these people is not directed towards the scientific community, it's directed towards the public. And that tells you right away that their goal is not to win a scientific argument or to enunciate a new scientific principle. Their goal basically is to persuade in the public media. In short, it's propaganda. And that's the real issue here. Right. And for for people who aren't uh, familiar with the history of some of this stuff, uh, if you want like a real small scale, but but very stark example of how propaganda is an appropriate word here, is you can look at the history of one of the sticking points in the famous Dover trial, the, the textbook of Pandas and People, oh. and the history of the drafts of that book, where it started off as a, as a creation science textbook, and it said creationism is blah, 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 blah. And then following a 1987 Supreme Court decision, Ken, I'm sure you know all this. I'm just for, you know, for everybody else. Following a 1987 Supreme Court decision, the wording suddenly changed. And now instead of creationism is blah, 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 blah. It was intelligent design is blah, 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 blah. But the blah, blah, blah didn't change. It was just, you're just literally doing a control. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly true. Let me flesh that in a little bit because it's a great story. It, it is. There's, there's a really famous example. So go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Which is, um, there was a textbook published, a textbook really published by an organization called the Texas Foundation for Thought and Ethics. And in 2004, um, the school board of Dover Area School District in Eastern Pennsylvania instructed their science teachers to prepare a curriculum for students on intelligent design. And they ordered two classroom sets of an intelligent design textbook called Of Pandas and People. Now, those... Those science teachers at Dover High School, to their credit, and at the risk of losing their jobs, they refused to do this. But the school board went ahead. The school board wrote its own lesson on so-called intelligent design, and they actually set the superintendent and his assistant into classes to teach a lesson on intelligent design and to refer to this textbook. Eleven parents in Dover sued the school board, saying this was a religious uh, religious, uh, idea, and therefore it violated their First Amendment rights not to have the state establish a religion. A trial ensued that was called Kitz Miller versus Dover. In advance of the trial, attorneys for those 11 parents subpoenaed the Texas Foundation for Thought and Ethics. And they said, we'd like to have whatever records you have of the development of that textbook, original drafts, revisions, editorial comments, and so forth. So this is called a subpoena deuces take home. It's a subpoena that says produce something. So a box with, no kidding, nearly 7,000 pages of various manuscripts arrived. And it was given to Professor Barbara Forrest, uh, who is a Louisiana biology, uh, sorry, excuse me, Louisiana philosophy professor. And Barbara started to comb through them. And what she discovered is this book had been written as a book on creation science. So there were very paragraphs where they would say, well, evolutionists believe this, creationists believe that. Creation scientists explain it this way. Creationists, creationists, and creationists. Then what happened is the Supreme Court decision that you mentioned, which is called Edwards versus Aguilar, basically found by a seven to two majority that creation science was inherently religious and therefore had no place in the public schools. Literally a few months later, suddenly that book changed. And what happened was all mention of creation and creationism was scrubbed from the book. 
and a new word was put in its place. And that word, instead of creation, was intelligent design. Now, one of the things that Barbara discovered is, uh, and I want you, anybody who's used Microsoft Word will appreciate this. What they seem to have done is to do a global find and replace where they replaced creation with design. They replaced creator with designer. And as anybody who's ever had a big manuscript and done a global find and replace knows, every now and then you get an unexpected change when that search string hits something. And there was a string that originally read creationist belief. And it ended up in this manuscript as kind of an intermediate form where it basically said, see design proponentists. So they had replaced, they wanted to replace creationists with design proponents. And there was this intermediate form right in there. Now you showing a, a perfect slide to show this. And if you'd go down to the graph that you had yeah, you a second ago, yeah, I'll that's point out the... everyone. So what <laughs> you see here, are various versions of the text. And Barbara Forrest is the person who did all this work. She deserves all the credit. And you can see various iterations going back to 1983, 86, 87, the first version in 87. And they mentioned creationism all the time. And they what barely reason? mentioned intelligent design. And then all of a sudden, right after <laughs> Edwards versus Aguilard, they switch. And suddenly every mention of creation becomes a mention of design. What this told the court. And you can see right there, the definitions are word for word the same. Exactly. And, and, and in fact, in my own testimony in the trial, I was able to show paragraphs matching between the two of them. Barbara was able to do the same thing. And what this told the judge was, and anybody who cared to look, was that intelligent design was put forward as a placeholder for creationism in order to make it sound non-religious, more secular, and therefore more acceptable to public schools. And the judge in the case, whose name was John Jones III, who I should mention is a lifelong Republican, was recommended to the bench by former Senator Rick Santorum and was appointed to the bench by President George W. Bush. The judge immediately saw this correctly, as an attempt to conceal the religious nature, religious roots, he called them, of intelligent design. And therefore, it was truly not only wrong scientifically, but it was impermissible in the public school classroom. It was an extraordinary, it was an extraordinary moment in that trial. I want to recommend to everybody, there are three books on that trial, two of them I have right here. There's The, the Devil in Dover, uh, there was 40 days and 40 nights because the trial itself lasted exactly 40 days, which uh, the judge actually commented on as he adjourned the trial. Yeah, he sure did. Um, and then the third one, which is gathering dust in the office that I have not set foot in since March, is called Monkey Girl, which is also excellent. Uh, I recommend all three of those books because they all come from kind of different angles. Um, the Devil yeah, in Dover, I have to tell you, I have to tell you that the one that is my favorite by far is The Devil in Dover. And the reason for, and that's written by an author named Lori Lebo, L-E-B-O. Um, now, the reason, the reason this matters is the other books were written by science writers or people who came from outside. In a couple of cases, the, the writers were British uh, and they were you know, embarking on sort of a field expedition <laughs> right. into the wilds of conservative America. So they were you know, looking at the people almost like an anthropologist. Lori, however was a local reporter for the York Daily Record, the local newspaper. She knew the people on both sides of this controversy in the town of Dover. She knew the teachers. She knew the school board members. And she really uh, is, you know, writes in a way that was sympathetic to what they thought they were doing. And because of that, I think Lori's book is not only the best written, it's the most accessible, and it gives the most realistic picture of what went on during this trial, which lasted, you mentioned 40 days, mm -hmm. 40 days and 40 nights. Um, the, uh, um, uh, and again, that's something the judge actually mentioned uh, at, at the very last day of the trial, but it lasted, you know, it lasted for seven weeks and it was an extraordinary event. It was highly publicized at the time. Besides those books, 
There also have been two TV documentaries done about it. Uh, one was done by the BBC. Uh, it's called A War on Science. And the other one was done by NOVA. And it's called Judgment Day. And the NOVA documentary is particularly striking. So if any of your, uh, your viewers look for Judgment Day, um, it's important to distinguish. It's not the Judgment Day with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's the Judgment Day that's on NOVA. And it's still available on the internet. Absolutely second that recommendation for both Devil and Dover and uh, the Nova documentary on the Dover trial. Both are the book, fantastically well-written, really gets into the, the, the heads of everybody involved uh, in a way that the other two books don't. The other two books, and in particular Monkey Girl, is really great as like a, like a courtroom drama, like blow by blow, but Agreed. you're not in the heads of the people that are, that are driving the event. For sure. Um, and then the, the documentary is just fantastic. And many of the people that you met, um, Dr. Forrest is in the, in the documentary. Um, uh, I know, uh, Nick Motsky appears in it was one of the researchers for the, for the plaintiff's team yes. that was, that was doing a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, highly recommend both of those resources for everybody. Um, we, so we've been talking for about 35 minutes. Um, if you don't mind, there's one more thing I'd like to ask you about, if that's okay Please. with you, I don't want to take too much of your time. Is that all right? Oh, of course, absolutely. Thank, thank you. I really appreciate it. So, um, one of the one of the things I want to recommend that everybody, uh, if you have a chance, I would I want to recommend that I've linked it in the description of this video on YouTube is a 1997 episode of the debate show Firing Line, uh, uh, which Dr. Miller appeared in along with a number of other um, proponents of evolution and proponents of intelligent design, and I forget if there were any specific creationists in it, or if it was, you know, intelligent design. Um, it was 1997. So it was kind of right on that. We're kind of rolling over from the old school creation science into the more like Behe era intelligent design kind of stuff. Um, but I, I want to ask you about your approach in that moment, because so this is kind of not your typical audience. It's, it's, um, it was, it was, um, if I recall correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was, it was, I was a, a William Buckley's kind of yep. arena. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like not your, your normal, like, you know, primetime TV audience. There's like a specific, you know, group you're kind of, you're, that are going to watch that kind of show. And, um, it was, it was a, the, all the panelists were extremely, you know, they were all experts, all very well qualified in either biology or philosophy of science or any number of other fields. And your, I just want to ask you about kind of your approach there. Like, was your goal going into it? Obviously, you were very familiar with the intelligent design arguments that you were going to hear. You were very familiar with the older style kind of creation science arguments that kind of spilled over a little bit into some of the into some of that those arguments. Um, was your goal going in there being like, no, Michael Behe, I'm going to convince you that your ideas are wrong, or were you kind of? And it seems like what I'm about to ask is the case is that you were more catering to like everybody. Let me show you kind of almost independent of who is saying what over here. I'm going to show you that, that what they're saying doesn't make sense. And what I'm saying makes sense. Um, could you just kind of take a few minutes and, and kind of, kind of go into your approach a little bit for. Sure. sure. No, yeah. uh, for the viewers who might have uh, been born too recently, <laughs> uh, William F. Buckley was sort of the intellectual father of American conservatism. Very erudite, extremely well-read, um, and uh, uh, you know, a genuine intellectual in every sense. And besides his regular program, he'd host a program called Firing Line, where he would uh, have on someone, very often someone with very different political opinions, uh, and they would debate an issue. And they would debate it really in an intellectual way. It's something we don't see too much on TV anymore. And you certainly don't see it on cable TV anymore. Um, and every now and then he liked to have a formal debate. Um, and in this particular case, uh, anyone who's done debating knows you have to have a proposition in order to have a formal debate. And you have to be either in the affirmative or the negative. Well, the proposition was very subtly worded, and the proposition was resolved. The evolutionists should acknowledge creation, which is it's not creation versus evolution, but resolved. The evolutionists should acknowledge creation. It was held at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. 
That's right. I forgot um, that detail. Yeah, I was right. Oh, there. believe me, I remember right it like there. it was yesterday. <laughs> and on the pro creation side, if you will, was uh, Michael Behe, David Berlinski, um, who was a, who fashions himself as a self-described intellectual and writer, um, and also um, the um, oh, uh, Philip Johnson. Philip Johnson, and right? Philip Johnson, uh, now deceased, was a uh, professor of criminal law at Cal Berkeley, and he had written a, a couple of books uh, against evolution, arguing sort of from the point of view of a lawyer, like the case against Darwin and that sort of stuff. On the other side, there was Eugenie Scott, who is the director of the National Center for Science Education, an organization that I'm now president of. Um, the, um, uh, the philosopher Michael Ruse, um, uh, Barry Lynn, who was the head uh, of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, I should say the Reverend Barry Lynn, uh, and myself. And it was a formal debate from the point of view that everyone got to make a five-minute presentation, then somebody on their side would question them for two minutes, and then there was a round when you would sort of go back and forth and so forth. And I thought, okay, so, so what do I want to do? Do I want to sort of, you know, it, it, it employ tricks of rhetoric and that sort of stuff? And I said, no, look, look I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a research scientist, and I'm also an educator. And I'm going to go in there as an educator. And what I did was to anticipate the arguments that I thought would come up. I anticipated them correctly, as it turns out. And because it was on television, um, with no facility to like show slides or anything like that, I printed out great big placards of uh, showing uh, fossil charts, uh, evolutionary lineages, and a whole host of other things. So that when I stood up to make a particular argument, I had a great big artist case with me. And I remember I'm married to one and I could bring up this large placard and hold it. And I could make the points that I would make in the classroom if I was showing slides or drawing on the board. And what I tried to do was to draw the attention of the audience to the actual evidence, to the authentic observations of scientists rather than relying on rhetoric, uh, uh, rhetoric, ridicule of an opponent, verbal tricks, and that sort of stuff. And I think it made a very, very strong impression. And the part of the debate that I remember the most was near the end, and I was paired against um, this writer, David Berlinski, who wanted to argue that the fossil record is vexed that it's ambiguous as to whether or not it shows evolution or not. And I simply held up chart after chart showing the fossil lineage, well-documented fossil lineages of a number of, of animal groups and saying, look, I came here to argue from authentic evidence. Uh, one side, just rhetoric. The other side wanted to show you the real evidence. And I really thought that was the most effective way to do it. Um, and I think uh, time has shown that that is indeed the case, that the most effective way to reach a general audience, even a very sophisticated one, which is what the viewers of the Firing Line program would be, um, the best way to reach that audience is to put them in touch with the scientific evidence, the scientific method, and let them understand why the scientific community has come to the conclusions it has. I think that is an excellent place to leave it as a nice summary put a nice bow on the approach to talking about evolution and creationism with a specifically non-scientific audience uh so i want to just uh to kind of reinforce that point i want to um just remind everybody of something dr miller said a little bit earlier in the conversation that the goal uh should be to uh and i have it written down right here is make the science understandable to an interested person and for everybody that's watching right here or engaging in the other, you know, the, the evolution creationism YouTube sphere, anybody watching this kind of stuff is going to be interested because you have to like voluntarily go seek it out and decide to watch it. No one's like stumbling. If anyone stumbled into this by accident, hi, welcome. I'm thrilled to have you. But my suspicion is that almost everybody that's watching this is like, I am interested in this topic. So what are, what are, uh, as, as kind of, 
uh, you know, proponents of science and as educators, I, I hope our goal can be to make it understandable to an interested person. That is, I think, an excellent kind of guide to to frame how we approach these discussions. So um, thank you, Dr. Miller, so much for appearing. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, going by the the chat going on on YouTube over here, the audience uh, really uh, appreciated and enjoyed that. So thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Uh, I appreciate you all being here. So I am going to sign off. Have a great day, everybody, and I will see you next time.